Good morning. I'm hoping you all are joining in. We're going to wait a few minutes and, and just chit chat while people log in. I see the participant numbers are going up. So just please be patient as you always are. But you should be attending the Hudson Genealogical Study Group's program this morning about how to research with funeral home records. Thank you for logging on. Good morning. I hope you're all enjoying staying at home on this chilly more January morning. I hope everybody's got a cup of coffee or a cup of tea and they can sit back and relax and enjoy the program. We have a, some more that are joining, so please be patient before we get started. Good morning. I see you all logging in. We're waiting for other people to join and we'll get started shortly. It's not quite 9.30 yet. You have a minute to run and get your cup of coffee. Well, I'll do some general housekeeping notes while people are logging in. You're joining the Hudson Genealogical Study Group's presentation about researching funeral home records with Molly O'Driscoll this morning. Um, I want to alert people that there is a board meeting for the Genealogy Study Group on the 18th of this coming Wednesday at four o'clock here at the library in person and by Zoom. If you would like a link to the Zoom, please send me an email, gwen.mayer at hudson.lib.oh.us, and I'll make sure that you have a link to join us via Zoom at the board meeting on the 18th. It's not necessary for the general population, but if you're a board member and you want to, or if you're just interested, let me know. Our next formal meeting is February 4th. That's a Saturday again at 9.30. It's the Saturday before my birthday, so you all should remember February 4th. Um, we are hosting arguably one of the state's greatest genealogical speakers. I have known her for upwards of 15 years. She is a phenomenal woman and she is a wealth of information. It is Diane Gagel and she is on Monclovia, Ohio, and she will be speaking about the Irish, um, I can't say this word, dys, dys, dysphoria. No, I don't have it right yet. Dysphoria. Dyspora, thank you, Molly. The Irish dyspora, in other words, the famine Irish coming to the US. She'll be talking to us about how to re research them, giving us some background history on the Irish in the US. Again, it's Diane Gagel, February 4th at 9.30 in the morning. And again, register as you did for this program at the library's website. This morning, we're very honored that Molly O'Driscoll is joining us, and she's going to speak to us about researching funeral home records. In case you don't recognize that wonderful last name, Molly is the daughter of our member Janet O'Driscoll. And so Janet may have perhaps volunteered her daughter or railroaded her, I'm not sure which, but we're thrilled that Janet did volunteer Molly. And Molly has a background as a counselor and supporter for a group facilitator when it comes to grief. She's been a funeral home director. She knows her way around, unfortunately, the funeral home and hospice and uh, the grief network that unfortunately touches us all. So uh, Molly seems like the perfect person to tell us about funeral home records, what's available, what we can learn from them, how to get them. Um, and she drove in from Columbus yesterday in the yucky weather, folks, just to speak to us and to see her mom. And the genealogy group was so indebted to Molly that a certain baker in the genealogy group baked her goodies. So when she came in this morning, she's going home with wonderful goodies um, to nibble on. And I want to ask you all to say hello and kind of make her feel welcome as much as you can through Zoom. And here is Molly O'Driscoll to talk to us about funeral home records. Okay. Welcome, Molly. 
Thank you. Thank you, Gwen, for the introduction. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for signing on this morning um, and spending some of your Saturday morning with me to learn a little bit more about researching funeral records. Um, I'm really glad to be here with you today. Okay, so we'll get started. Um, so a brief overview of our time together today. We've got about an hour together, and um, this is sort of a general outline of the things I hope we might cover during our time today. Um, so the objective of our time is really to talk a little bit more about the history of mortuary and funeral home records. Um, and then we'll spend most of our time today talking about the sorts of information that you can find in those funeral records, um, the different types of record keeping and formats that exist for um, keeping that important information together, the different contents of those records, the processes for getting some of the information that can be found in those records, and how you can access some of that information for your own research. Um, we'll also talk about some considerations later in our time together today. So some things to think about when it comes to the accuracy of the information you may find, um, how to make a request for this sort of information, either from the funeral home or other organizations, and then some personal considerations um, to help you take care of yourself as you um, participate in this important research. And then finally, we'll have some time at the end for questions. Um, I believe Gwen is gonna keep track of that for us. You can put those in the chat as well, and we'll spend some time to go over any questions at the end. Okay, um, so we'll start off with some history and some background information about funeral homes and funeral records. Um, this information comes largely um, from an important research, oops, excuse me, I went back too far, uh, familysearch.org. Um, so funeral records generally began in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, before that, there weren't necessarily specific records kept um, for the details of death information. Um, prior to the Civil War and the death of President Lincoln, um, embalming in the United States was not a widely accepted practice. Um, and so there were some things that weren't quite regulated or weren't quite practiced um, in a common way before that time. Um, prior to that time, most funerals actually took place in the home of the deceased, um, where that person's family and friends would help prepare their body and host a ceremony in the home um, to honor that person. And because embalming was not a common practice, um, burial often took place within 24 or 48 hours in the local community um, for, for burial. Um, according to Family Search, um, large cities are probably more likely to have earlier funeral home records. And that's because many rural areas did not have funeral homes until the early 20th century. And since the 50s, um, there's been a lot of transition through funeral homes. Um, many funeral homes since that time have merged together. Um, they've closed or been purchased by some national companies. Um, you may have seen in your local area funeral homes where there are multiple last names listed for the funeral home name. That might be an example of families coming together and merging their funeral homes. Um, you might also see signs like Dignity Memorial or a Dignity Memorial provider. Their signs are green and they're an example of a national company um, that has purchased uh, smaller family owned funeral homes. Okay, so some general information about funeral homes. Many funeral homes are still family owned and for multiple generations. Um, so it is not uncommon to have multiple generations of a family um, involved in the funeral home practice in different ways. Um, your funeral home personnel are part of your community. Um, sometimes in the media, funeral directors can be depicted in a way that um, maybe they look like lurch or a little bit um, standoffish or separate from the com community, but really your funeral home personnel are part of your community, um, just like other professions. There are some cultural differences among funeral homes still into this day. Um, in funeral homes, you might still see some segregation and that's not necessarily a negative sense um, as far as the funeral industry that people might um, patron, patronize a funeral home that is part of their culture. Um, maybe people of their culture are part of their church community or other community. And so there could be pre-existing relationships there. Um, certain funeral homes may have more expertise in certain religious practices um, or certain funeral practices based on faith or culture. Uh, in the past, funeral homes um, 
provided services to a family for multiple generations. So it wasn't uncommon um, for the Smith family, for example, to use the same funeral home anytime they had a death in their family. Um, many families had shared with me, oh, my, my family has always used your funeral home. It's not so much even a question at the time of the of a death of a loved one. Um, and with that, there can be really valuable records available because you might have multiple records for family members kept at the same funeral home, if a family used the same funeral home. Um, traditional practices of funerals um, was maybe well, I should say practices are maybe more traditional in the past as well. You might have for example, a wake before services um, that might be two hours, or you might have a funeral service the next day. It might be hosted in a church and with a burial. Um, today, there are some different trends in funeral service um, that are worth noting, especially in, in your research. And so some of those present trends are impacted by some of these things I have listed here, individuality. Um, folks will say, I want to do something different. I want to do something that's unique to me, something that has more personality and speaks to who I am as a person. Um, and that can be important, but can also um, change what your record keeping or what your services look like a little bit. Families have relocated and spread out over time. Um, while in the past, you might have families that live nearby or multiple generations of a family living in the same home, um, people are spread out and with transportation are able to move around. Um, and so that can impact the people uh, present for your funeral services too. In a digital age, um, funeral homes provide services where they're recorded also and, and shown over Zoom or or can be played later so that folks are out of town can attend from a distance. Um, many folks will identify more now as being more spiritual than religious or practicing a religious structure. And so you'll see that impacting the types of funeral services that people request. Concerns about the environment um, and waste is also an important consideration. Cremation rates have increased. Um, and a different focus on ritual as well. Um, as a funeral director, um, one of the things I share with families is that <clears throat> your, your service serves to honor the deceased, but also to support the family as they begin that grief process, as they start to adjust to life in a different way without their loved one. And so that ritual from my lens is very important, um, but other things can impact that. People might have different views on that. Um, people might want to get it over with as quickly as possible, um, or there could be financial concerns there too. Um, and so that is worth mentioning, uh, mentioning also that the cost of services or selection um, can impact your funeral trends and the record keeping that comes from that. Okay. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about funeral records. Um, a funeral record itself can start in two different ways, um, before the death of a person or after the death of a person. Um, you may have heard at some point um, language around pre-need funeral arrangements or pre-planned funeral arrangements. Um, sometimes this is mentioned in commercials for insurance companies. And what a pre-need arrangement or record is, is um, a file that started before the death of someone. Um, so an individual might come into the funeral home and say, I would like to sit down and plan for my services um, before my death. And this can really um, bring some peace of mind to folks. It can also start that record keeping process um, earlier. And that information is then coming from that individual, his or herself. Um, these pre-need arrangements can be funded or unfunded. People can um, select items and they can pay for those things in advance if they'd like to. Um, but when that pre-need funeral record is started, it usually contains demographic information about the individual, what they'd like to select for their own services. Um, it might include photos of them that they'd like to include for the newspaper or for a program, financial information or other documents. 
So a funeral record can also be started at the time of death. And these records are often referred to as at need records. Um, so this would be an, an example of this would be um, when a loved one dies and then the family comes in to make arrangements for that person after the death. Um, this record may include the same information, um, but a big difference here is that the family is providing the information for the deceased rather than the individual providing their own information prior to their death. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about some of those pre-planning documents I had mentioned. Um, and as I had said in commercial, sometimes you might hear about pre-planning your funeral, and that's a service that insurance companies can help with. Um, and so this personal family record, I have a copy of it here as well, um, is really a booklet that an insurance company or a funeral home might provide um, to help an individual uh, start recording some of that information prior to their death. Um, so you have on the side of your screen there a record of vital statistics. There's space there to include your name, your address, um, your birthplace, date of birth, um, the name of your spouse, when and where you were married, education, employment information, uh, military information, etc. Um, so these were these booklets um, or pamphlets can be very useful in pre-planning for services and also for um, communicating your wishes to your family. And so whether that's something you're considering or not, um, it can be helpful to know that these documents can be part of funeral records um, and that sharing that information with your family can help them make um, choices in line with your wishes at that time. Okay, um, so funeral records can come in a couple of different formats. Um, quite often, funeral records are still in paper or on paper. Um, there are some platforms to take information digitally, and some of the funeral planning process is done over the computer, of course, um, but many funeral home records are still paper. Um, funeral homes can keep track of information in a couple of different places or in a couple of different ways. And so one of those would be a case file. So what you have is a picture there of a case file. It's um, sort of like a manila folder, but it has a bunch of information on it. Here's an example, and you can see the thickness of this one. Um, it has information on it to help the funeral director and the staff um, make sure they've taken care of all the tasks for planning. Um, so you see there are some marks there for the newspaper, paper, for example, or making sure you have a flag um, for veteran service. So some of those things to help make sure that you're um, planning, you know, and following through with those plans. Funeral records um, can also be kept in a ledger book. And for scale, that looks like this. It's a large book generally. Um, and in these books, information for multiple people is kept. Um, so you might look up uh, the last name of an individual and then be able to go to that page for more information for that particular person. Um, I had mentioned a case file is that thick paper file that has multiple documents in it. Um, it's a folder itself and it contains an arrangement worksheet, which we'll talk more about. Okay, so this slide shows us a couple of different images for the inside of that register book or ledger book. So again, um, this would be your ledger book and the page there on the one side is blank and shows some demographic vital information on the left hand side. And on the right hand side is financial information for your service. Um, the other image there that is titled Virginia Funeral Home Record um, is an example of one that has been completed. Um, and this came from Family Search as well. So some of those speech bubbles show us the name of the deceased is there, the birth and death dates, where the death took place, um, the name and birthplace of the parents, where a person may be buried. Um, and then on the right hand side, you have the services that were provided. Um, for example, if an obituary was placed in the paper or flowers were ordered for the service, all your financial information would be on the right hand side there. Um, in your ledger books, you'll also have information for the next of kin and for payments made to the funeral home. Um, so again, you could go to this book to find some background information about an individual, um, a next of kin that might have handled services for that person, and then a list of payments or receipts from the family or from insurance, et cetera. Okay. <clears throat> 
So we will talk a little bit more about those case files. And again, those case files are those paper files that contain different documents for planning purposes at the funeral home. Um, so we'll talk about today, that today, sort of a, a general case file, maybe a minimum amount of information you can expect to find. Um, and then we'll talk more about files that might have more information in them and be more detailed in that way. Um, so a case file really begins um, with first call information. And so your first call is the initial contact with the funeral home following the death. Um, so for example, should a loved one die at a hospital, the hospital or family member would reach out to the funeral home and share, this person has died, we'd like to use your services and coordinate um, transportation of the loved one to the funeral home and to schedule a meeting with the funeral home for follow-up. Um, so during that first call, that initial phone call or contact, the location of the deceased is provided, usually the time of death information, who will be signing a death certificate and who's the next of kin, who's the family member that will be the point of contact for arrangements. Um, your funeral arrangement worksheet would also be included in funeral records. We'll talk more about this, um, but a hard copy example of that, sort of a trifold document um, that can really house a lot of information. And again, we'll talk more about that, but this worksheet is used to collect vital information to prepare a death certificate. And it also includes all the service information um, for a memorial or funeral service, the method of disposition, and if the person would prefer um, burial, cremation, uh, transportation out of state, uh, et cetera. Your funeral record also um, likely includes a death certificate, um, perhaps not a, a certified copy, usually a photocopy. Um, we'll talk more about affidavits if applicable, which is a, a supplementary document if you need to make any revisions to your death certificate. A burial transit permit. Um, you have to have a permit issued uh, to be able to go to the cemetery for burial or to be able to go to the crematory for cremation. Um, so a copy of this permit should be in the file as well. And then any financial information for services. You may find a cost estimate from that initial meeting with the family, um, the final contract or funeral bill based on what folks decide um, they'd like to have for services, and then possibly some insurance information. Okay, so I had mentioned that arrangement worksheet, um, and again, that's this document as an example. Um, this arrangement worksheet is a, a primary resource for funeral directors um, to help keep together all that important information. Um, so the arrangement worksheet is completed by the funeral director during the meeting with the bereaved family. Um, so after you've had that first call contact, you've scheduled a meeting with the family and the family comes in to meet with the funeral director, it's during this time that that arrangement worksheet is started and completed. Um, if that person had pre-meet arrangements already, if they had um, plans already started with the funeral home, the funeral director should have that information and would review what was already planned with the family in case there were any updates um, or to make sure everybody's on the same page in that way. Um, otherwise, the funeral director uses this time to gather information from the family to complete the arrangements. Your arrangement worksheet contains the following information, um, vital statistics about that person. So again, their name, um, their date of birth, that sort of information, biographical information. Where were they born? How far did they go in school? Um, are they employed? Are they retired? What sort of services you'd like to have for a funeral or memorial? Um, so you can have a lot of details in your arrangement record around where will the church location be? What will the time of the service be? Um, who will the pallbearers be? Sometimes by name in your record. Um, clergy can be named, specific music requests can be named in your arrangement worksheet as well. Um, your final disposition. So again, should a person choose burial, cremation, um, transportation out of state, this information would also be in your arrangement record. Any merchandise selected for services, examples include a casket or urns, flowers or tribute items, and additional information. Um, perhaps a copy of the obituary might be written in the arrangement record. Um, if a person chose their clothing, the details of the clothing that they'd like to wear um, may also be included in that record. And again, the, the purpose of this arrangement worksheet is to keep all of those details together in one place 
and then it is used to prepare the death certificate for that person. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about death certificates. Death certificates are legal documents and they're used to record the details of a death. Um, I had mentioned affidavit earlier. Um, an affidavit is a separate document and it's required to make any corrections or revisions to a death certificate. So let's say, for example, a person um, chooses a cemetery for burial and then they decide that they want to choose a different cemetery. Um, an affidavit would need to be completed to update the name of the cemetery. Um, an affidavit does not replace a death certificate. Um, what it is is a supplementary document that would be stapled to your original to show that correction or a revision. Death certificates are initiated and filed by the funeral director, and the state requires that a death certificate is completed for each person um, upon their death. Death certificates are filed in the county of death, and this is really important. Um, so if you um, if a person say is traveling um, away from home and should die while they're away from home, their death certificate would be filed in the location of their travel rather than where their residence was. And so that's important to keep in mind as you might be searching for death certificates um, is perhaps to know the county where that person or where that death took place. Um, so the location of where you can find this document um, could be a local office of vital statistics, um, perhaps a board of health for that county. Um, in smaller towns, they might have different um, community services together. So you might contact um, the city council office for this sort of information um, of where, where death certificates are filed in that county. Um, death certificates are certified documents, they're official documents. Um, and sometimes you might hear, I need an original death certificate. Um, what that refers to, and we'll talk more about this too, um, an original death certificate looks something like this. And on here, I, I realize that may be difficult to see, but there's an official seal on here. There are different watermarks on here. And so if you ever hear the terms certified death certificate or original death certificate, it's referring to a copy like that rather than a photocopy. Um, the costs of death certificates can vary by county, um, and the different procedures for accessing those death certificates can be different. So you're going to want to check with your local Office of Vital Statistics for what their um, costs and procedures are for that. So as an example, in Franklin County, death certificates cost $25 each, um, and they're available from 1908 to present. And death certificates are available for those that died in Franklin County only. Um, the application process for death certificates for different counties um, can be a little bit different. And so an application may or may not require you to say your relationship to the person um, whose certificate you're requesting, or what is your purpose for requesting that certificate. Other offices um, don't necessarily ask for that information, so that can vary. Uh, death certificates are required um, for different purposes. Um, some families prefer to have an original copy for their own family records, um, but original copies are often required for legal matters or financial matters. Um, should you need to go to probate court? Um, should you need to transfer any properties? Um, if you're planning to use an insurance policy or to close bank accounts, um, even utility companies sometimes will ask to see an original death certificate. Um, for those purposes. Um, one thing to make mention of too is that a family can decide how many copies of a death certificate or how many original copies of a death certificate they'd like at the time of service. Um, should you find or should a family find they need more in the future, you're always able to get additional copies. Okay, um, so death certificates include a lot of information. And as I had shared, and I'll show again, a death certificate, at least for the state of Ohio, is a quite
quite a long document. Um, and it's divided into five different sections of information. So at the top of your death certificate, you're going to have information about the decedent. Um, so this is the person who's died. Um, this is their certificate. And so that um, information for the decedent section will include their legal name. Um, and I have their AKA if applicable. Um, so for example, if a woman changed her name and maybe went by both her maiden name and married name, she might list two names on a death certificate. Um, if a person maybe went by their middle name instead of their first name, um, they might include both names on their death certificate uh, to avoid any sort of confusion in that way. Um, the sex of a person will be listed on the death certificate, the date of death, social security number, the age of the person at the time of their death, their date of birth, where they were born, city and state, where they live now, um, including their street address, if that person was ever in the military, that would be marked yes or no. If the answer would be yes, then you would put the branch of the military, such as army, for example. Um, if a decedent was married, then the surviving spouse name is included on the death certificate. If the surviving spouse is a wife or female, um, her maiden name would be included on there rather than her married name. If a person's of Hispanic origin, that is marked yes or no. The race of a person is included on a death certificate. If a person identifies by more than one race, more than one race can be listed. Um, father's name, mother's name, and maiden name. The informant's name. So your informant is generally your next of kin um, and their name, relationship, and address is also included there. Your funeral, excuse me, <clears throat> the place of death. Um, so for example, this might be um, the residence. If someone died at home, this could be a hospice facility or hospital or other location. The funeral director's name and signature and license number, the funeral facility signature, or excuse me, funeral facility address. Um, so all of that information on your left-hand side there is about the deceased themselves. The disposition is going to be the next section of your death certificate. And so this section talks about um, what will what the plans are for the body now that that person has died. And so here you would see listed if that person was buried, cremated, if they were removed from the state, um, if they were transferred to another funeral home, or if that person was perhaps um, shipped to go farther across country, for instance. Uh, the date of that disposition, when that is scheduled, um, if there's a cemetery or crematory, that specific location should be listed, as well as a city and state for that place. Your registrar is going to be the individual at the Office of Vital Statistics or at the Board of Health that certifies this certificate. And so that person's signature and district number will be included. The date that the document was filed um, will be stamped on there as well. The name of the person that issues that burial permit we talked about, and then the date that that was issued as well. Your certifier on a death certificate is the person that um, is signing off and, and pronouncing that this person has died. And so the certifier is either a physician or the coroner. Um, if a person uh, is under the care of a physician at the time of their death, um, a physician is usually the person to sign the death certificate. Um, if a person dies and had not been under the care of a physician for quite some time, um, that might be referred to the coroner's office. Um, the coroner is always involved um, based on certain, certain circumstances of a death. So if a person, for example, may be found involved in an, um, in an accident uh, or other manner of death in that way, the coroner's office is usually um, involved and then the coroner will sign that certificate. Your certifier will include the time of death, um, the date that that person was pronounced dead, um, were they referred to the coroner, yes or no, and then the coroner will sign that as well with their information. Your cause of death then is included um, on your death certificate as well at the bottom. And so the name and the address of the person completing this section is included. And then your cause of death information. So on there, you will see the immediate cause and the time intervals, and then any underlying causes and time intervals. Um, so say, for example, a person um, had pneumonia at the time of death. Um, so their primary cause or immediate cause might say pneumonia um, one to two weeks. If that person, for example, had 
cancer for a number of years, you might see cancer as an underlying cause and years. Um, so that is how different um, information can be included for causes of death. Um, in part two of the cause of death section, you might have other contributing factors. So um, if that person used tobacco, for example, were they involved in an injury, um, was the manner of death an accident or other. Um, so some other information that can provide additional detail can be included on your certificate as well. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, whoops. Let's talk a little bit about the death certificate process and how you get this document. Um, so I had mentioned that starts at the funeral home. The funeral director collects information from the family and generates a death certificate draft document. Um, this document is then submitted to the physician or coroner's office um, for that cause of death information to be completed. Once that is signed, um, that document then goes back to the funeral home and the funeral director signs off on it. Uh, from there, the death certificate goes to the Board of Health or Vital Statistics, I use those interchangeably, and it's there that that draft is submitted for filing and becomes a certified death certificate where you'll get that copy with the seal and the watermark. From there, the document goes back to the funeral home. The funeral home contacts the family, provides them as many copies of that certificate as they ordered, and then at this point should make a photocopy for the case file. Um, so again, just to review that one more time, that document starts at the funeral home. It then goes to the doctor's office for signature and cause of death. It comes back to the funeral home for signature. It goes to the Board of Health for filing um, and certifying, comes back to the funeral home again, and then goes to the family, um, and copies are kept for the file. Uh, one thing to make note of here is that this process can take a little bit of time, and that can vary. Um, and sometimes that can cause um, some anxiety for families if they're trying to secure financial information or resources in that way. Um, but timelines can vary based on the cause of death, um, physician schedules, coordinating all of those moving parts. Um, one thing to mention is that death certificates from the coroner's office look a little bit different than maybe from a, a traditional death certificate um, where you might have a physician already in place or a natural cause of death that was maybe long term. Um, when a case goes to the coroner's office, the coroner's office will usually provide um, a supplement and that information will perhaps say pending until they can get the results of the different tests that are performed during an autopsy. Um, so those test results can take some time, sometimes even up to 10 weeks. And so what the family would receive in those cases would be a death certificate that says pending on the original, and then a supplement, a secondary document that would list the specific cause of death information once all the aut autopsy uh, information is complete. Okay, so how do you obtain a death certificate? Um, there are a few different ways you can go about that. To my knowledge, there might be others that exist as well, but here are some um, that might be helpful to you in your search. Uh, you can visit your county office of vital statistics or board of health. Um, you can often go into that office in person and complete paperwork to request and order a death certificate. Um, you can also visit that office online um, or they can send you things by mail and those timelines can vary uh, based on how you're trying to obtain that certificate. Um, the Ohio Department of Health website is listed there. That might be a resource to you for finding um, different death certificates for the whole state of Ohio. Again, keep in mind that death certificates are filed in the county of the death. And so you'll wanna make sure that you're contacting the appropriate office um, based on the county you need. Um, the Ohio Department of Health has some laws and rules in place as far as um, how long they keep records. And I believe it's after 50 years, some of those records are then transferred to the Ohio History Connection for archiving. And so if the Ohio Department of Health is not helpful to you or, or your research is outside of that timeline, um, you can try Ohio History Connection for some more information there. 
the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is another resource where you can navigate information for different states, um, all from their website. Their website is listed there, and that QR code there is for that website as well. Um, so if you have your phone handy or want to take a screenshot of this page, you can. Um, if you hover over that QR code with your camera, that website should pop up for you if that's of interest to you. Um, private companies also exist that might help you in your search. Um, Vitalcheck.com is one example of these private companies um, that might also have different documents for you. I've not used that myself, um, but I found that in, in my search. And then you can contact your local funeral home as well. Um, your local funeral home may have an original or a photocopy in the file, and they might be willing to share some of that information with you. Um, they might be willing to order a death certificate for you. Um, funeral directors and person, funeral home personnel are going to the Board of Health quite often to get certificates for current services. And so they might be willing to, to add some information to that order form for you um, if you ask. Okay, um, so we had spent some time talking a little bit about case files. And again, that case file is gonna be this sort of style of funeral home record. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about what a more detailed record could contain. Um, and so just kind of work our way through this. Um, that case file might include apparel and accessories for your loved one. Um, perhaps the, a loved one had a favorite color or wanted to wear a certain suit. The details of that information might be listed in your case file. Um, did the person wear jewelry? How do they want their hair styled or their nails polished? Information like that may be included in some more detailed records. Um, embalming reports. Um, for for the embalming practice, there are certain forms that embalmers complete about their process for taking care of a body in that way. And so you might have physical characteristics of an individual included, maybe their height or their weight. Um, if a person was an organ donor, there might be information in the record about what they donated after their death, um, which can be really meaningful to know. Uh, disposition details. I mentioned that records will contain whether a person chose burial or cremation. Um, if a person chose a cemetery, um, either for, for traditional burial or to bury cremated remains, um, your specific grave location could be in that file. Um, so this cemetery, this section, this lot, this grave number, um, some of that information could be contained, depending on how detailed your records might be. Other personal records could be included in your funeral record. Um, so for example, you might have a copy of someone's birth certificate or marriage certificate in their funeral record. Um, military records might also be included in a funeral record if a person was seeking um, military services. And so those documents might be included as well. Family members records. Um, I had touched on earlier how Many families will say, oh, my family has always used your funeral home. Um, similarly, families will often bring in a program or an obituary from another family member and say, we really like this style. Can we duplicate this? Or the relatives are all of this, are all, they're all the same relatives. Can we use the names from this program for a new program? And so you might have copies of other family members' information and records as well, including that obituary or funeral program. Um, the deceased obituary, if they decided they wanted to publish something in the newspaper or on the funeral home website, there could be a copy of the obituary in the program, or excuse me, in the case file as well. Um, your funeral program for services could be included, and I'll talk more about that. Um, memberships and affiliations. Um, you can have information about where a person belonged to church, if they were part of a professional club or organization, um, maybe a choir or a bowling league. Um, that information could be included in your, in your case file as well. Financial information for services, um, some insurance information may be included in your file. Um, photos, either of the loved one for the paper, um, maybe a photo to help the funeral home um, you know, plan and prepare the person for services, as an example. Um, also, condolences can be included. Um, for, for instance, um, we had individuals, the funeral home where I worked, who uh, received a letter of recognition from the mayor. 
you know, or res, uh, received a resolution from their church family. And so copies of documents like that of condolences could be in your record as well. Um, and family handwriting can be in your record. Um, families can bring in information that they'd like the funeral director to use for services. Um, there's an example here of some information that's handwritten. And so you might be able to find the actual handwriting um, of loved ones in your record as well. Okay, um, so I wanted to take a moment to, to share with you an example of a funeral program um, and talk a little bit more about the information that can come even from this document alone. Um, so Miss Leota Woodfork, um, this is her funeral program. And there are a couple things on this that I wanted to make sure um, I shared with you as, as an example. And so for her services, um, her date of birth and date of death are included right on the front cover of her program. Um, the time and location of her services and the minister that was officiating. On the back cover of the program there, um, family members' names are listed for pallbearers. Um, honorary pallbearers are those that walk with the casket but don't carry the casket. Um, their names are listed as well. Uh, flower bearers were church members. Um, and then the location of the cemetery and acknowledgements are included as well. Um, so on her program itself, there's a lot of information about people that were significant or important to her in her life and details about her funeral. Um, on the inside here, we have an order of service for her. Um, people are specifically named who participated in her services. Um, the specific musical selections for services, uh, who provided the eulogy, um, who had a different role. And so again, you can gather information um, about scripture references that were important for people and others who involved in their life. Um, Leota's parents are pictured on one side, um, the mother in a photo of seven daughters, and the seven daughters are listed by name there, who's standing and who's kneeling in that photo. And so not only do you have information about Leota for her funeral services, you have a lot of information and photos of family members in her program as well. Um, inside the program, um, you have some additional information that you can learn. Um, she had a twin sister and there are photos of her and her twin sister at different stages of their lives. Um, so this information can be not only helpful to Leota's family, um, but to her sister's family as well. Um, siblings are pictured on the other side there. So brothers and sisters who are all listed by name and sister May is not pictured and it's listed there that she's not pictured. Um, so some information and photos about siblings as well. Um, there's a picture here of Leota and her vocal choir and the different people by first and last name um, that were in her choir. So there can be um, information about other people that, again, were important in her life. And that might also give you some more information about her church participation. You might be able to contact her church and learn more information about archives they have there or to share this information with church too, um, to be able to share those resources. And so um, I think it's really neat in this example that so many pictures were provided. This is not always the case. Um, this is just an example of a very detailed program, um, but some of the information that may or may not come from that. Um, there's a favorite scripture um, in her obituary that lists a little bit more information about her life, um, her beliefs and what was important to her, and then other family members and the dates um, that they preceded her in death, um, surviving family members, and other important details about her life. Um, she was an LPN, for example. It says when she moved um, from one city to another. And so a lot of different information can be in your funeral program as well. Okay. Um, other items that might be in your case files. Um, so sometimes additional information is required depending on the services that are selected. So for example, military honors is a good example. Um, if a person served in our military and would like to have a military service or military burial, um, a copy of their discharge forms are required to be able to request that service. And so here's an example of a DD-214 form that might say when that person enlisted in the military, when they were discharged from the military, um, and that documentation is required if you wanted to have services at a, um, a national cemetery. 
One thing to make mention of too that I came across in my experience was sometimes the dates don't always match for veterans. Um, sometimes veterans might change uh, the information they share for their date of birth so that they could, could enlist in the military. They might have um, change the date to show that they were older than they were or that they were younger than they were. Um, so that's something that comes up sometimes and as far as accuracy worth noting. Um, there can be some information in the case file about the rights of the next of kin. Um, we live in a world where our families are, are blended and broad and each is very different. And what that means for some families is that there's some discord planning at times of services. Um, maybe folks were estranged or there were complicated family dynamics. Um, and so you can have information in your case file about um, who has the right to plan for services or who has the right to know information um, or for different information or items to be released to them. Um, and so you can have some information about families included in the case file as well. Insurance policy information can be included in your case file, which I mentioned, um, and beneficiary information. So say, for example, um, there were four children in a family and each was a beneficiary on an insurance policy, you would likely have information for all four of those beneficiaries in the record as well, um, because that policy is being used for funeral services. Um, families often provide copies of additional information. So I had mentioned, you know, a family might come in and say, could you please use this program from another family member? Um, and so they might just say, oh, keep it, you know, and that, that information then would stay in your case file. Um, and then items sometimes are not retrieved from a family afterward. So again, if they provided a program, they might um, not want it back or not come back to pick it up. Um, sometimes you might have photos or other items in a file um, because a family doesn't return to pick up those items afterward. Okay, um, so at this point in our conversation today, we'll talk a little bit about some different considerations as far as record keeping and obtaining some of these records for your research. And the first of those is accuracy. Um, so in funeral service, best practice is to encourage accuracy and try to do this in a variety of ways. Um, sometimes we may request additional documentation to verify information. Um, sometimes families aren't quite sure um, or might debate a little bit about certain information. So the funeral director might suggest, you know, do you have the form at home that might help us get more information? Um, we might ask families to bring supporting documents to the funeral home. You know, if, if your relative had a booklet like this, feel free to bring it with you. We can look through it together. Um, so supporting documents like that can be useful to encourage accuracy um, of your funeral records. Um, and then once information is collected for the death certificate, let's review it together. Let's make sure we proofread it, um, maybe sign off on that everything looks good for us to move forward with it. Um, another consideration for accuracy is family history and word of mouth. Depending on which family member is providing information, they might have a different family history, or they might have think that they heard some information from somebody else, but aren't quite sure. Um, and so some of your accu accuracy can be influenced by word of mouth um, in that way, or different, different family knowledge. Families can also have their own preferences for how information is included on a death certificate. Um, so I'd mentioned an AKA for the name of the deceased. Um, a person might prefer one name is listed, um, but the funeral director may encourage you to list two names, especially if um, insurance policies have a different name on them. Um, that has to match in order for the insurance policy to, to pay for those services. Um, other preferences that the family might um, consider our education or racial identity. Um, for example, you know, perhaps a person didn't quite finish um, schooling, but wanted to go ahead and put on the certificate that they did. Um, or perhaps, you know, a, a person identified by more than one race, but they only want to put one race on the death certificate. Um, in my role and per, from my perspective, I always, always encourage families um, to give information accurately since it is a legal document. Um, but that can be a little bit sticky sometimes, especially as families are grieving. 
Another consideration there is human error, um, that folks can make different mistakes or have different information. And so, as I mentioned, families might have different knowledge. Um, they might not quite remember some of those details and just do the best that they can. Um, when you lose a loved one, you're experiencing a lot of shock and a lot of grief and a lot of fatigue, making so many decisions at the same time. And so through that process, mistakes can be made as well. Um, mistakes can take place at the funeral home. Clerical errors can happen um, and do happen occasionally. And so if there are errors, there would be an affidavit completed uh, to correct a death certificate, for example. And then handwriting. Um, some handwriting is easier to read than others. And so some mistakes can come from um, misreading handwriting. Okay, um, so access to funeral homes. Um, how can you get access to some of these records or what is accessible? Um, the funeral industry in the state of Ohio is overseen by a state board. Um, there are officers in place um, to make sure that funeral directors and funeral service personnel are practicing ethically and that there are some standards for that. However, the Ohio Administrative Code and Ohio Revised Codes don't specify or regulate decedent records. Um, this is a little bit different for those pre-need records that are arranged ahead of time. Um, but as far as how long at-need records are kept um, or a process for releasing information to the public, there's not regulation really around that. And so what that means is that can be up to the discretion of the funeral home to release that information. Um, and so details of the person requesting that information and the request can be important. Um, the dates of records can influence that and how accessible that information can be. Uh, physical accessibility of the records. Um, many case files, for example, are stored in filing cabinets or some of those file storage boxes. And so how accessible is some of that information you might be requesting? Um, can you get that information from one of those red ledger books? Um, or do you need a case file depending on the information you're seeking? And then is it available or not? Um, many funeral records are uh, kept indefinitely by funeral homes. Um, some records are transferred as funeral homes merge or are closed. And so does the funeral home have the information that you're seeking? Um, perhaps there was water damage, for instance, and, and records could be lost in that way as well. Um, so various factors can Im impact access to funeral records. Okay, um, so some considerations in making a request from a funeral home for records. Um, what I would encourage you to do personally is to share your purpose for your call and your relationship. Um, my name is Molly. I'm calling to get information about my grandmother um, for my own family genealogy history, um, for example. It is helpful as a funeral director if a person provides as much detail as you can for your request. Um, do you know your loved one's first or last name? Do you have any idea of the dates that that person or the date that that person might have died? Um, providing specific information can help the funeral home help you. Um, so the more information you're able to provide in that way uh, can, be, can be very helpful um, and can help you get that information sooner. Um, another thing that you can do in making requests is to ask the funeral home, are there other locations or suggestions you might have for research? Um, for example, a funeral home where I worked, we had some older records um, that we donated to our, our main library for their archiving. And so we might not physically have those records on the premises anymore, but that information is still um, preserved at another location. And so asking about where might be some other places I could look for this information could be helpful to you. Um, another suggestion might be to offer to pick up that material or to send a prepaid envelope. Um, you know, offering to come by to retrieve that information can be one less thing that the funeral home staff might have to, to um, figure out for you and can get you that information sooner. Um, generally, your funeral director and your funeral home staff wants to be helpful to you. Um, and so the more information, again, that you have that you can share um, helps us to help you get what you need or direct you hopefully in a 
more helpful direction. Um, and then to please be patient with your request. Um, again, we're glad to help as, as well as we can, um, but sometimes that information can take some, it can take some hunting for information. Um, I had shared, let's see, I had mentioned before, you know, that sometimes retrieving information is up to the discretion of a funeral home. And to give you an example about that, um, say, for example, you called and you wanted a copy of the program for Leota Wood Fork, that example that we looked at together. I would gladly give you that program. And, and my own personal rationale for that in that way is that program would have been distributed to the public at her service. So from my lens, that's public information. Um, should you call though and say, you know, I'm looking for the address for her next of kin, um, that would not be information that I would provide to you. I would say, um, let me take your information and I will do my best to contact the family to let them know you're trying to reach them. Um, so that might be an example of some of that discretion and what that might look like as an example. Um, is the information you're requesting public information or was it provided publicly um, like an obituary as an example as well? Okay, um, and to put on my to take off my funeral director hat and put on my um, mental health counselor hat for a moment is to consider some of the personal um, personal impacts of doing some of this research. Um, in a digital age, we have more access than ever to information. And with that can come a lot of excitement. Um, and so with that also, I wanna caution you just to recognize your own limits through that research, um, to make sure you're taking care of yourself through your research, um, balancing, the work-life balance in that way and taking, again, taking care of yourself through that process. Um, I also wanna gently caution you around the impact that this research can have on your personal life. Um, family records, funeral records, um, things like DNA testing kits, um, TV programs like Finding Your Roots. Um, many times we'll see commercials uh, for excitement on learning new information or different information about ourselves. And that can be true. Um, however, discovering new information or different information can impact your identity. It can impact your mental and emotional health um, to learn new information about your family um, or your origins. And so I, I gently want to caution you in that way and encourage you um, to recognize that that can impact you and can impact others in your family and family dynamics. And so if that's something you've experienced or may experience in the future, um, that you're not alone in that. Um, people are available and care to help support you. And so to seek that support if you're experiencing any of that as well. Okay, um, I wanna say thank you for sharing some of your morning with me. Um, I'm hopeful that some of this information was helpful to you in your own um, search for genealogy records for your family or for others. And to thank you for your commitment to preserving really important history. Um, I'm welcome, Gwen, to take questions at this time and otherwise kind of finish up with some humor of, I have nothing further to say. Well, Molly, you had a lot to say and we all really enjoyed it. It was very informative. Thank you so much. This was arguably one of the best presentations we've had recently. So Carlene wants to know, was the year when death certificates become required? What was the year when death certificates became required? I do not know the answer to that question. I do know that in Ohio, it's 1907, 1908. It's either one or the other. But in every state, it's different, Carlene. And certainly every nation, it's different. But in Ohio, it's 1907, 1908, they become required. And okay. they are held from the state that point on. They may be held at the county level earlier. It depends upon the county. We really don't know. And I appreciate that. That actually makes good sense. I know for Franklin County, they don't have records older than 1908. So that coincides with what you're sharing. Carol wants to know, is there a cost to do an affidavit to make a correction to a death certificate? Generally, no. That would be something that comes from the funeral home typically. Um, I do not know if the public can make a correction. Um, someone else wants to know if the funeral is in a church, are there duplicate records kept there in the church? 
That's a good question. Um, your funeral records, a duplicate of your funeral record would not be kept there, like a case file information. However, the church might keep their own records for services held there. I know, for example, I had mentioned, you know, resolutions and different condolences a church might send. I know churches do keep um, those, those documents. So those resolutions are kept in the archive of the church. So you may have a record there, but it would probably look a little bit different than your funeral record. Judith wants to know and say that it was an excellent presentation, but she has to go. She has to leave early. She had a commitment. But is there an email handout? And if there is one, can you email it to her? Um, I do not have an email handout, but I could work on something like that. Thank you. Um, someone else wants to know if cremation remains, if cremation remains just handed over to a family in an urn, is there a record of who took them? Yes. Yes, so um, if a family chooses cremation, a family member would come back to the funeral home to retrieve those remains. At that time, they would sign out those remains. So there's documentation of when they were retrieved. And the, the family then is given a copy of that burial transit permit. So it's usually a card with that um, deceased information on it. You need to keep that document um, safe with your other personal documents. And that's because if you ever decide in the future that you want to bury those cremated remains or have them inurned at a cemetery, you will need that document for the cemetery. Margaret wants to know what happens to records held by a funeral home that closes? Is it or bought out? Does it get handed on to the next funeral home? Is there a process for which to preserve these records? That's a great question. Um, generally, if a funeral home is bought out by another funeral home or if they merge, the records are maintained or transferred to that new ownership. Um, I can share an example of a funeral home where I worked. Um, it closed and I personally donated all of those records to the library. I can add that in my little town, our funeral home has been bought out three times and each time the new owner maintains the old records and mm -hmm. they're more than happy to search through them and provide them should we need them. Mm -hmm. um, someone else asked, where can you get a copy of the personal planning booklet? That's a great question. Um, you can contact your local funeral home and ask them if they have a resource for you that they can share. Most are glad to share that with you. Um, also, sometimes um, insurance companies offer those booklets as well. Viv wants to know if an obituary is printed with inaccurate information, how can we correct that erroneous information? That's a, also a good question. Um, if an obituary is printed with inaccurate information at, at that time, if that's, if that's caught by the family, you can ask the funeral home to correct that information and rerun the obituary. Helen says, excellent presentation, thank you. Catherine wants to know, in your experience, how accurate, are death certif how accurate is the death certificate information? Very accurate. Uh, Lori wants to say, excellent presentation, thank you. Bruce says, not a question, but a big thanks for such a wonderfully done program. Um, and Alan wants to ask about green burials. What's happening with respect to green burials and documentation? That's a good question. I don't know much about where that is, that um, process is right now. Um, green burials, there's, there's, there are more trying to think how to organize my thoughts to answer that. There are more options available for green burial. Um, that would be something to check with your funeral home about on what sorts of services they provide in that way. Um, not every funeral home is maybe equipped to provide every sort of um, method of disposition in that way. Margaret wants to know, is there an association of funeral directors who would be able to provide more information on funeral homes bought out by other funeral homes? Um, there are some associations for funeral directors. Um, one of those is the Ohio Funeral Directors Association, um, OFDA. 
I'm not sure if they may keep track of that sort of information, um, specifically as an organization. The other thing that you could do is contact the state board, um, the Ohio Board of Embalmers and Funeral Directors. Um, they keep track of all funeral homes that have been closed or bought out as well. Sherry and Margaret both say excellent presentation. Margaret says you, she learned a lot and she has some great ideas going forward to get past her roadblocks now. Great. Um, let me see if there are other questions. Do you guys have other questions coming in about funeral home records? For those of you that are requesting a handout, I'll get Molly perhaps to do some kind of a handout or at least put her PowerPoint, PowerPoint presentation into a, a document for us so that you guys can all receive it. Um, I do have your emails and we'll try very diligently to send them out. Um, I'm not seeing a bunch of other questions. Oh, wait a minute. Michael said, can you post up the QR code square again? Yes. Apologize to scan back this way. There you go. Um, two other people said, thank you so much, Molly. And Sandra Bean said, excellent. So you're getting a lot of rave reviews. And I have to say that I think it was one of the best I've ever seen on funeral home records. And I would caution you all, they're a wonderful source of information, but you really need to be very polite and very um, understanding when you, re when you request these from funeral homes, because they really don't necessarily have to provide them to you but they will try and do their best generally. Mm -hmm. Would you not agree, Molly? I would agree. Yeah. And what I'll share is just some additional information. So a book like this, a ledger book like this, would be easier for the funeral home to find for you. Generally, at least, you know, where I was, the, the years of death for that book would be, you know, posted on the side. And so if you called a funeral home, say, say you were seeking, um, Say you're trying to find the cemetery where Sally Smith is buried and you know that she died in, in 1995. You know, if you can call and say, I'm looking for the cemetery location for Sally Smith, I know she died in 1995. That gives me a lot of information on what you need and how I can find it for you. You know, for a question like, I'm looking for as much information you have as you have on Sally Smith, but I have no idea when she died, or I know it was between 1970 and 1990, that there's a lot, you know, there's a much wider range of, or yeah, a much wider range of, of space there that can be a little harder to, to be able to find that for you. Catherine said, can we find today's presentation on familysearch.org? Catherine, no, you cannot. However, you can find it on the Hudson Genealogical Study Group's website. So I would tell you to look at the Hudson Genealogical Study Group's website. And if you can't find that address, please call the library and ask me and we'll get it to you. Um, Ellie wants to know, is it appropriate to email the funeral home for information? If so, who should I address it to? Yes, it's appropriate. Um, you can address it to the funeral director. Um, I might also encourage you to follow up or to please be patient if you don't hear back right away. Other question, uh, questions, comments? Thank you all for joining us. I would remind you February 4th will be our next presentation. I would also tell you in March, we're going to have your pres uh, our presentation live here at the library and it will be Mary Hughes. Um, remember, February 4th is a virtual Zoom and on March, in March, it will be an in-person program. So please register. Molly, thank you so much from the group. You've really made our day and helped us, I hope, figure out how to find out in more information and, and uh, understand a little more about the process. I wish you all a great day. Please go out and enjoy the day and all of you take care and have a wonderful day. Thank you and goodbye.